Welcome to a different episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, because this week it's actually the Science of Getting Faster podcast. We're going to listen to episode three of this new podcast that we've just launched, and it's with Dr. Gil Pofe, and it's about ketones and bicarbonate. Seemingly strange things that probably aren't connected. We've heard about bicarbonate helping with lactate buffering, and we've heard about ketones uh, acting as an alternative fuel source. But can they work together is the question that they wanted to find out, and can they be helpful to each other? So enjoy this episode where we talk to Dr. Pofay all about what he and his researchers learned along the way, how they structured the study, the things they didn't observe that they expected to, and honestly, some surprising results from this one. It's a really cool episode, and we're going to be going into ketones in more depth later on with this podcast as well. And speaking of that, every month, we'll be recording a new episode with researchers that are in the bleeding edge of science in terms of how it makes us faster as cyclists, doing research or doing studies, performing research, and the actual ones that are in the trenches. So it's a fantastic podcast. If you listen to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, you're going to love it. So there's a link down below. You can click to find that podcast and subscribe to it. Please do that. Uh, we're going to have a ton of great episodes, like I said, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So without further ado, here is Nate, Chad, and Dr. Pofe. Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast. This is the podcast where we get past the headlines and talk directly to the research to find out what their studies suggest and what they don't. I'm your host, Nate Pearson, and we have Chad Timmerman with us. Hi, everybody. And today, everyone's going to love this one. We have Dr. Heel Pufay. Hello, everyone. And we are going to talk about ketone esters, two episodes in a row. I don't think we've ever talked about this on the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast because the research is really still new. Um, Dr. Pofay, why don't you give us a background of uh, a history of your background? And then we'll go into like ketones and what those are. Uh, so my name is Hugh Pofay and I'm recently started as a postdoctoral researcher at the Exercise Physiology Research Group at the KU Leuven. And I also perform my PhD here in this lab. So under the supervision of Peter Hespel and my PhD uh, focused on the effects of ketones on the acute response to exercise and also how it may impact your training. And I first got in touch with those ketones through my uh, master thesis in which we performed the first ketone study here in our lab. That's amazing. And uh, Peter Hespel is like, he's kind of a rock star, right? In the, yeah. in the industry of researchers. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I don't know what to say about it. Uh, <laughs> well, we can move on. Peter actually works for Dakuna Quickstep, correct? Yes. So, yeah, Peter is a scientific director also of the Buckle Academy, and they supervise uh, Quickstep, and they give some advice to the riders and also to the medical staff. This is awesome. Okay. So let's go into ketone esters. So I bet a lot of people they've heard the name, but don't know what it is. So what are ketone esters? So first an important difference to make is the difference between the ketones that our body produces itself. And then on the other hand, we have the ketone ester drinks. So first ketones is a name refers to three molecules. And these molecules are produced by our liver in under conditions when there are limited carbohydrates available. So this stimulates our liver to convert uh, fatty acids into ketones. And those ketones can then be used, for instance, by our brain to survive periods of uh, low energy availability. So through fasting, or also by using a ketogenic diet, we can increase or we can stimulate our liver to generate ketone bodies. So this is the endogenous form of ketones. But recently, uh, they developed a ketone ester drink. And with this drink, you can simply increase your ketone levels in the blood within only 30 minutes. And you get the same levels of ketones in the blood as a couple of days of fasting without having the difficulties of adhering to a fasting period or to use a ketogenic diet. So why would somebody want uh, ketones in their blood while they're exercising? Uh, first of all, there are studies suggesting that uh, ketones can act as an alternative fuel for skeletal muscle. 
So ketones can replace uh, glucose as an energy source, and as such, we can spare muscle glycogen, which is really important because we really need, for instance, in a cycling race, to use muscle glycogen. So muscle glycogen is really a rate limiting factor. So if we can have an alternative energy source for muscle glycogen, it's really beneficial. And secondly, there are also indications that ketones can not only act as an alternative fuel for muscle glycogen, but it may also be a more energetically efficient fuel. And as such, it might increase exercise performance. And my next question is, so, so I've heard of ketone salts too, right? And those are pretty inexpensive. And then there's ketone esters, which are like, it's like $30 or $33 for 25 grams. It's expensive. Um, what are, what's the difference between ketone salts and ketone esters? So with the ketone salts, in this case, you get a ketone body, which is binded to a salt, uh, like for instance, potassium. But you really need a high amount of ketone salts to get an increase of ketone levels in the blood. And as such, you will often get some gastrointestinal complaints due to the high salt intake. So it's really difficult to get to high ketone levels in the blood with the ketone salts. While with the ketone ester, you only need, let's say, 25 grams to get to really high ketone levels in the blood. So people with, I think the problem is with ketone salts, they like get upset stomach, right? If they try to do too much and they just can't tolerate it. Yeah, it's definitely true. Okay. So then you have this study and you're trying to find out if bicarbonate can help unlock ketone performance, right? Or performance while ingesting ketone esters. Why, what, why did you think of this? Like what, what were you, why you combine the two? So we first performed a study with only the ketone ester and placebo. And there we observed that with the ketones, there is a decrease in blood pH when you ingest the ketones and also the blood bicarbonate, which is a buffering agent, drops due to the ketone ester intake. And this is really negative to your performance because bicarbonate, bicarbonate is used to buffer the protons in your blood. So it's clear that when you uh, go to the final in a race and you have decreased blood bicarbonate, it's definitely negative. So therefore, we might think if we counteract this decrease in blood pH and also blood bicarbonate, we might see a beneficial effect of ketones. So therefore, in our next study, we provided the ketone ester together with bicarbonate to look whether there is an effect of ketones when your blood pH remains stable. That's really cool. So just to summarize that previous study, it was that we did a 30 minute time trial on that too. Is that right? In, in that case, we did a first a three hour submaximal exercise bout, and then they performed a maximal time trial of 15 minutes. Well, no, not this one, not the uh, bicarbonate one, but the previous one was just ketone esters, no it's, bicarbonate. It's, oh, same it's thing? Same. Yes, it okay, was exactly cool. the same study. Okay. Did you close both well, those studies with a 15-second sprint? Yeah, uh, at the end was always uh, a maximal sprint for approximately one minute. Do you minutes. remember okay. then how much lower was the performance for the group with ketone esters? In that study, despite the lower blood pH, there was no decrease in performance. So performance was similar between the ketones and the placebo condition. But it's important to note that in that study, we provided ketones only during the first part of the race. So when the subject started their time trial, the ketone levels were again low. While we also performed another study in which we provided ketones during a 30 minute time trial, and in that case, there was indeed a decrease in performance of approximately 2 to 3%. And that's significant for people. It might sound small, but that's significant, especially that's significant. Yeah, if you're doing a 40K time mm -hmm. trial or a, I guess it'd be a shorter time trial in that distance for humans, uh, it's, it's significant. Okay, so let's go into now this study. We want to know if bicarb and ketone esters increases performance. 
And why did you think actually before in that previous one? So your blood was more acidic, but performance didn't decrease at the end. Why did you think, did they like balance each other out, the ketone esters and the acidity? What, what do you think happened? Yeah, so we think that clearly the lower bicarbonate levels would be something negative. But if we didn't, as we didn't observe a decrease in performance, there should be any advantage of having the ketones. So we think that the positive effects of the ketones were leveled out by the negative effects of having lower blood bicarbonate concentrations. And then in this study, you're going to try to remove the negative effect by introducing bicarb, right? Yes, indeed. So we hope oh. to counteract the negative effect of bicarbonate and still have the positive effect of the ketones. It seems like uh, re reading your like little body, or not little, but uh, the small studies that I've, the few studies that I've read, I'm sorry, I'm saying this incorrectly. It seems like you've had a question and now you're systematically attacking it right at different phases to try to find the true answer, which I think is super cool. So yes. anyways, okay, moving on. And I also, I also want to mention, I fully appreciate the approach that you guys with, with the, the methods or the, the design of your study and that you basically use three hours of low intensity, but also it included some intermittent efforts. And then you follow it with a time trial and then you follow it with a sprint, which is a really close mm -hmm. approximation of the sort of stress they'll face when they do an actual road race. Yeah. We'll get into the methods, but as everyone, as you'll find out, you guys understand cycling, obviously, right? So you made it try to be, I don't know if this is for a team or whatever, but you want to know for real world performance rather than, I don't know, a, a ramp test or something like that. It, it wouldn't really replicate a real world. Uh, yeah. It's always the idea of Peter Haspel to just mimic the real conditions because otherwise, yeah, it's not really worthwhile. So for instance, we also provide the, uh, optimal doses of uh, carbohydrate during exercise because there are other researchers who just uh, investigate the effect of ketones in a fasted state of without providing carbohydrate during exercise. But we really want to see whether there is an additional effect of ketones in a real life setting. Yeah, because pros would, uh, or just cyclists in a race would ingest carbs and then you want to know if with ketones, if you get faster. Yes, indeed. Okay, so next question, what is bicarbonate? So bicarbonate is a buffering agent that is present in our blood and it buffers uh, the protons in our blood, which we generate by performing a high intensity exercise. So this bicarbonate uh, counteracts the decrease in blood pH. So therefore often uh, sprint uh, athletes ingest bicarbonate to uh, counteract the decrease in blood pH during exercise. And then like, and heal, so how, go ahead. He, heal, we also have an endogenous system, right? That buffers blood pH. Yes. So we have uh, uh, yeah, the bicarbonate to buffer the, the blood, yeah, to buffer the protons to have a stable blood pH. And besides that, we also have some buff other buffering systems in skeletal muscle itself. So we have uh, the carnosine system, but with the bicarbonate, it's really focused on the blood pH. Okay. And then so so what we're is supplementing, it? we're supplementing an endogenous system with exogenous bicarbonate. Yes, indeed. So it's a bit the same as with the ketones that we give something that is already available in our blood. Got it. And then, so how does somebody uh, get bicarbonate? Do you buy it? Is it in your pantry? So in our case, we put it in, uh, how should I call it? It's capsules. Uh, capsules. Capsules. Yeah. So we put it in capsules uh, before exercise and during exercise, we just uh, put the powder into the sports drink. Wait, is it just baking soda? It's just baking you? soda. Yeah. So whenever people, you hear sodium bicarbonate, it's just baking soda, like the stuff you have in your, uh, in your pantry, pantry, which is crazy. It just doesn't seem like something you would ingest in large quantities. Okay. So now we've got the characters on stage. Let's talk about the method. Okay. So how big was this study? Do you, uh, and I have all the details if you forget any of them, but, uh, how many cyclists did you recruit? And that study were 12 cyclists, I think, or, um, not really I think it was sure. nine or 12, or you finished with nine. 
Yeah, it's, it's always a different number in different studies. So it, it doesn't matter. It's around nine, there. For nine. Nine, nine cyclists. Okay. So and, we used nine well-trained cyclists. So they all had to perform cycling for at least six hours per week. And they had to have a VO2 max above 55. So it's a really well-trained uh, cyclists, but definitely not professional cyclists. Yeah. And then what was the, uh, like, tell me the method, like, how did you, can you just walk us through the whole method of trying to figure out if, uh, like the, the different controls and the double blind crossover and all of that. So we had nine well-trained cyclists and they performed four times the same, uh, exercise once only with ketones one times with bicarbonate alone one time with ketone acid plus bicarbonate and once with a placebo for both ketone and for bicarbonate. So both for the ketone ester and the bicarbonate, we had a placebo, which was similar in taste and appearance. And then the subjects, what they did was a three hour submaximal exercise bout followed by a 15 minute time trial and then a maximal sprint of approximately 60 seconds. So during the first part of the race, uh, in the ketone ester conditions, the subjects received ketone ester in order to increase the ketone levels in the blood during the first part of the race, but not at the end of the race, because it was believed that ketone ester intake uh, counteracts the decrease in muscle glycogen but we really want to use muscle glycogen during high intensity exercise. So that's the reason why we only provided the ketones during the first part of the race. And then in addition, uh, the subject received uh, bicarbonate starting uh, from breakfast and also during exercise. So in this case, we could investigate the effect of ketone ester alone of bicarbonate alone and also the combination of both of them. This is really cool. So um, I'm going to give some numbers because it's some math so that it, uh, people at home can kind of make some sense. First, the, the the three hours and then the TT or the hard effort. To me, I think of a flat stage in a grand tour, right? Where the first maybe three or four hours, very easy. And then it kicks up. I remember, uh, uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell that story later. The second is you did 65 grams of ketone esters. So like three doses, it was a 25, a 20 and a 20. That is a hundred dollars. People 65 grams. It is not <laughs> cheap. Um, so if this is something you want to do in a race, the proteins can do this. No problem. But imagine an extra hundred dollars per race in order to do this. And then the amount of sodium bicarbonate was 300 milligrams per kilogram. This was spaced out over time. But for me at 86 kilograms, that would be 26 grams. And that is a lot, all of that at once. And I would be like 300 or 30, 300 milligrams per hook. It is 300. Oh, geez. Got that wrong. So this would be with the, how they space this out was, uh, 90 milligrams per kilogram with breakfast. For me, that would be 7.7 grams with breakfast. Then it was 30 milligrams per kilogram an hour and 10 minutes before that's 2.5 grams for me. This is the same thing 30 minutes before that's 2.5 grams. And then, uh, they had about 50 milligrams per kilogram an hour in the bottle with the 30 grams of, uh, I think it was a glucose, uh, in there. So for me, that would be 4.3 grams. So basically per hour, you're getting 4.3 grams. You could probably taste that a little bit in your bottle. I'm not sure. I know you guys, when your control experiment, you, um, match the taste, but just yes. for people, if they wanted to try it. And they also had a 30 gram carbohydrate bar, uh, also during that time. So they were getting 60 grams of carbs per hour and then another maybe 4.3 grams if they're a big rider per hour of sodium bicarb. Cool. Okay. I think, so I hope that all makes sense. And then what now, actually, before we get into that, so these people, they would come in and they would do this in the morning, this test. Is that right, Heal? Yeah. So they came in into the morning, then uh, already in the evening before they received the standardized uh, dinner just to have similar glycogen levels at the start of exercise. And then in the morning, they reported to the laboratory and they received again a high carbohydrate 
uh, meal. And then two hours later, they started with the exercise. So why now, uh, why would you be concerned if like a couple of people had a really high carb dinner and then other people like had a low carb dinner, but had the same calories? This is really important because uh, the amount of carbohydrates that you ingest determines the levels of muscle glycogen in, so in the muscle. So if you ingest a high carbohydrate diet, you will get higher muscle glycogen levels. And this is what you really want if you perform high intensity exercise. If you perform low intensity exercise, it's not really necessary to ingest high amounts of carbohydrates because uh, the carbohydrates are only really needed during high intensity exercise. So if you perform high intensity exercise for optimal performance, it's required to have a high carbohydrate diet. So then if somebody did high and someone else did low, that could have impacted the study, right? You wouldn't be able to tease out if ketones were ketones plus bicarb were beneficial. Yeah, definitely. So it might be, for instance, that in a subject who already used a ketogenic diet or a high fat diet for a couple of months, uh, also had some endogenous ketones and this might impact the results. So therefore, we want all subjects under uh, high carbohydrate availability. Awesome. And just curious, what was the dinner and breakfast that you gave them? So in the I'm evening, not picture like airplane food, <laughs> like a tray. In the evening before, it was a pasta. So a, a typical pasta bolognese with uh, a huge amount of pasta and only a little bit uh, sauce. And then in the morning, they just received some white bread with uh, jam and then also um, a small snack. So just uh, a biscuit. Hmm. Okay. Chad, do you have any uh, questions before we get into the results? Not at this point, no. Okay. Drum roll. What were the results? So first of all, with the ketones alone, and also with the bicarbonate alone, we had no effects on the time trial performance. But in the condition where they received both the ketones and the bicarbonate, there was an increase of approximately 5% in the performance during the time trial. And then for the sprint, there was an effect of both bicarbonate and ketone acid plus bicarbonate. So ketone acid plus bicarbonate resulted both in an increase in performance during the time trial as well during the sprint. That's amazing. So it was about the 5% equal to these riders, about 12 watts for 15 minutes. And uh, for those that aren't familiar with power-based training, that's very significant. 12 watts at the end, like on a hill climb for 15 minutes and you're dropping everyone else behind you. It's very good. So this makes me think that if you were to have a, this kind of case, we had a long stretch of moderate to easy cycling, and then you had a really hard effort at the end, this strategy might be good. Do you agree? Yeah, this would indeed, this is really a replication of a real cycling race. Um, and if you use ketones like this, it's indeed beneficial. But it's really important to have the design in mind so that you know that we only provide the ketones during the first part of the race. So maybe if you ingest the ketones just before the time trial, the results might be completely different. I remember there was uh, Julian Alaphilippe, I forget what stage it was, but he went back to the, to the car and got a bottle and there was only like an hour left or something. And then Lance on his podcast was like, he was taking ketone esters. That's what he did. He went back there, did it. And that's why he won. And then that's kind of got a lot of people talking about ketone esters, but knowing who you guys work with and knowing what team Julian Alaphilippe is on, I would suspect that he was not getting ketone esters in the last hour from the car. If anything, he might've tried them or had them really early in the stage. If it was going to be an easy effort. Uh, that's just opinion and I don't know anything about it and you don't have to tell me anything unless you want to, if you know the real answer, I don't know. you don't know. Okay. No, sorry. 
So, Heal, one thing that people always talk about is with uh, sodium bicarb is it can make your stomach upset. Did you, how did you track that in the study and did they, did they have any discomfort? Cause they took, they ingested a lot. It's always a, a comment by the reviewers, how we were able to get the bicarbonate without having the gastrointestinal complaints. And it's really important to use a design as we did. So we really provided multiple doses of bicarbonate. So we already started at breakfast, and then we gave the uh, uh, most of the dosage. And then we only give some small dosages during the exercise itself. So this is really important to have those split dosages. Because if you will ingest it all at once, you will definitely have serious gastrointestinal complaints. I've tried it all at once and it, it felt like knives. Like I tried <laughs> 20 grams all at once. It was, it was like hours of pain. I, I couldn't race at all or do my workout. Uh, no fun. Another thing that was very interesting is uh about the hunger in the different groups the perceived per perception of hunger can you cover that so we observed that with the ketone ester intake you get a decrease in your appetite so you have less hunger uh, less desire to eat and with the bicarbonate this negative effect on appetite was completely counteracted so it seems that with a decrease in blood pH that you get with the ketones, that this triggers a reduction in appetite because with the bicarbonate it was completely counteracted. And it definitely makes sense that with ketones, you have a less hunger because ketones, uh, we generate them if we have low uh, food availability. So in this case, it would be beneficial if you're less hungry. So it makes some evolutionary sense that ketones decreases appetite. So Heal, you're, you're talking about when you're actually ingesting the ketones and blood ketone levels are elevated, right? So this wouldn't affect post-recovery or po post-workout. That's something we don't know at this point yet. So we okay. didn't uh, measure the really food intake, but we know that they have less desire to eat. So when we would leave the subject completely free, it's likely that they will ingest less calories after exercise, but we don't know for sure. Okay. Yeah. Your survey about hunger was post-exercise, correct? Yes. Yeah. And they said they're not as hungry. And I saw you, you thought that this could inhibit performance because you might be less likely to drink a recovery shake, have protein carbs afterwards. But Indeed. like you said, yeah, you don't okay. know. So this is this is really interesting, and I'm just kind of going to drop a little teaser. Something I want to discuss when we talk about your next study. Okay. Cool. <laughs> That's the next episode, everyone. Stay tuned. Uh, okay. So the the last thing that I thought was pretty cool in here is that you asked all of your um, subjects to identify afterwards what they did, like what they took in each round, and um, were were they able to figure it out? Uh, no. So they were unable to know uh, when they ingested the ketones or when they ingested the bicarbonate. They definitely do not know. So because our placebo for uh, the ketone esters, so the ketone ester has a really bitter taste. So it's really awful to ingest it. And we were so evil to make a placebo that it was even disgusting as uh, the ketone ester. So and therefore they were unable to know whether they received the ketones or the placebo. So your blinding it, was very effective. Yes. They, uh, ketone esters, it, they taste like nail polish remover smells. That's, that's what I think. Um, but I also, I think beet juice concentrate is worse. The other cool thing about this is, um, during the, the time trial, uh, you set them up with the wattage based on some fam familiarization. Not I didn't say the word right, but who cares? Um, and then as they went through the time trial, they could raise or lower the intensity, but they couldn't see their watts and they couldn't see their heart rate. They just had a countdown timer. So that's another nice thing that blinded it. So they couldn't say, well, I'm really, you know, I have a power goal or a power target, or I want to beat last time. They just went by feel and try to get a maximum effort in those 15 minutes. And two, the order was switched around for everybody too, right? So, uh, you're, you're shaking your head. Yes. But I, I think the, can you just say, can you say just yes? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. So um, that way, because you could say, you might argue that, well, if they all did it in the same order, maybe they got better at time trialing or they got grittier on that fourth time. But because this is in a random order, we can kind of remove some of that from the results. And then also the increase was so large that then that's how you can measure it and know that it wasn't just random. Is that correct? That's completely correct. So we also looked whether there was a difference in performance between the first, the second, third, and the fourth time, but there was no difference. So this really means that uh, the familiarization was uh, sufficient to level out the learning effect. Wow. So this is really cool. What? So does this study say what this... What this doesn't say is that I should use ketone esters for every single workout I do, correct? Because that's probably that's not good. Completely yes. correct. So this only says that when you ingest ketones during the first part of a race, when there is a submaximal intensity, then you might see a performance increase at the end of the race. Yeah. But if you ingest ketones during the high intensity phase, the results might be completely different. We also observed that we did it in another study where we provided ketones just during an all out time trial, and there was a negative effect of the ketones, and also with ketones plus bicarbonate. That's super interesting. So, if you know your competition is taking ketones at the beginning of the race, you punch it. You make that race so hard because they're going to get knocked out, they're going to get kicked out the back. Uh, so, yeah, anyways, we, go ahead. We also observed that in our first study there that when they were at high ketone levels, they uh, had a higher perception of fatigue. So it really shows that when you have high ketone levels in the blood and you have to perform high intensity exercise, it might be really difficult. So if you have a small climb at the beginning of the race, it will be really difficult to keep in the peloton. Oh, now, Hill, does, this, does this research suggest that anytime you're taking on exogenous ketones that you should supplement with sodium bicarbonate in all instances? In the studies that we did, uh, we suggest to always also use the bicarbonate because there is no instance at which you want to have lower blood pH or lower yeah. blood bicarbonate. So we suggest to always use the bicarbonate. Okay. But even in the 30K time trial, or the, sorry, the 30, you, the, 30, you got a 30 minute, 30 minute time trial in another study, the ketone plus sodium bicarbonate still had a decrease in performance. So you can't Indeed. get away. You can't get away from it. Indeed. So it's, we don't know the mechanism behind that, but might be that with the ketones you get, you can use your muscle glycogen less and you just need this muscle glycogen during high intensity exercise. And bicarbonate doesn't affect that process. So that might be the reason why in that case, it doesn't help to go and just bicarbonate. Well, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Our next episode, we're going to try to figure out is, well, what if we take ketone esters after you work out? What does that do? We're going to record it right now, but uh, it'll come out sometime after this episode. And uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Pofay. Really nice. It was nice, was nice experience. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Pofay. And if you want more episodes like that, once again, you can subscribe to the Science of Getting Faster podcast. There's a link down below. You can click on that, whether it's on the podcast or YouTube video, however you're consuming this podcast. And you can subscribe. We have a playlist on YouTube and you can hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also subscribe to it with whatever podcast app you use and auto download. That can help so then you don't miss those podcast episodes that you really want to listen to when you're on some sort of a long ride and you don't have cell reception. So hope you enjoyed it. And please let us know if you did, give it a rating. Five stars would be awesome. And you can do that on whatever podcast app you're using or let us know down in the comments below. What else do you want to hear about with ketones or what other studies do you want to hear about? Let us know down there once again in the comments. Looking forward to talking to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.